Well, good day to you and uh, welcome back to our second installment on Sons Behaving Badly of the Father and Son Wineskin. And today I want to deal with several other characteristics and uh, examples of sons that behaves badly within the Father and Son Wineskin. I think one of the well, most well-known ones that we all know about is the first one that I want to share with you, and that is the one of Korah. Now, time doesn't allow me to read the whole story of Korah to you, but you're welcome to go and study it. You will find it in number 16, as from verse 1 up until verse 50. And what I want to share with you today is the features or characteristics of the Cora operating system when it starts to manifest in sons in your household. Now, first of all, what we need to know is that this system is activated by delegation of authority. The Cora operating system only services after delegation of authority has taken place. If you look at Numbers 11 verse 16, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. So we see here that Korah was activated only after uh, th this authority was delegated uh, to them. Secondly, what we see is that this Korah system interrupts the voice of God when God is speaking. When we look at uh, Numbers 15 in verse 41, it says... I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. We see that as we study the chapters in the book of Numbers, that in chapter 17, we see God continues to speak and he's instructing Moses after interrupt the interruption that took place in uh, number 16 of, of Korah. In number 17, verse 1 and 2, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and get from them a rod for each father's house, all their leaders according to their father's houses, twelve rods. Write each man's name on this rod. And so we see God continued to speak to Moses, because Moses was the man that God has placed over the congregation. What we also see is that Korah, or the operating system of Korah, actually freezes the movement of God and that which what God is doing. Uh, and if you look at number 16, it says, Now Korah, the son of Ichar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi. Now, when you look at the meaning of the word Korah, it means ice. So this operation system that we call the Korah system actually freezes the move of God. And the conspiracy that takes place under this operating system delays and delayed the progression of the nation of Israel whilst they were in the wilderness. Also, Keeping looking on, on, on to number 16, and let me just uh, read it to you again, because we don't always pick it up when the first time. Uh, it says, Now Korah, the son of Esau, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben. And look at the last two words of this verse. It says, took men. You see, what this system does, or this operating system, it does not equip men, it takes men. And the impression is, is created that of a kind of a mental invasion 
we see things taking place such as thought insertion and coercion and overriding of one's free will, free will that takes place. So this Quora operating system actually influences people and sons in the house against the legitimate godly ordained authority. The core of spirit is also a spirit of conspiracy. And uh, if we continue on as from where I stopped at the end of this one, where it says he took men, it says, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, and men of renown. Now, when we look at the word conspiracy, the word conspiracy means the plotting of two or more persons to do a wrongful act. So we see that this core system uses people of secular power and carnal strength in order to give momentum to what they want to do. And uh, one of the things that we see from people operating with this system is that people within this group are often not able to take instructions from their spiritual leaders. They will always be going the opposite way. Uh, we also see that one of the methods that the Cora system uses is that it will muster support for itself through the use of false accusations. Now, if you look at number 16, the three, we see that Cora was was, was saying to Moses, now you take too much upon yourselves for all the congregation is holy. Every one of them and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? And even in verse 13, he says that you should keep acting like a prince over us. So what do we see here? We see that Moses as the said man was falsely accused of setting himself above the congregation. You see, this system, what it actually does is it confuses holiness with function. All were holy, all were separated unto God, but all did not have the same function. And Moses' function as the set man, as the father of the nation, was to deliver God's instructions to a rebellious generation that was alien to the purposes of God. And his ministry of giving instructions, or if you want to call it an instructive ministry, was falsely presented by the Korah operating system as being self-exaltation in order to gain support for the conspiracy. The core of system also jeopardizes holiness. Now, if you look at number 16, verse 47, and let me just read that to you. It says, so when Moses heard it, he fell on his face and he spoke to Korah and all his company saying, tomorrow morning, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Do this, take senses, Korah and all your company, put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that that man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. See, what we need to understand is that when conspiracy starts lifting its head against the set man or the spiritual father or the leader, we see that the group that is involved, everyone that is involved in this conspiracy, ceases to be holy because they no longer separated unto God, they separated unto themselves. And we see if we read the story that the earth swallowed the unholy as a testimony to this fact. So we need to understand this principle. Yes, all of us, we are holy and separated unto God, but not all of us have the same function. Being famous did not entitle one to start operating 
in the set man function. When the congregation undermines the set man function and perceives its office as a function that can be performed by people because of fame rather than the call of God, they cease to be holy. Another feature that we find of the Korah system is that it demonstrates ambition for leadership. Now, if you look at nine, verse 9 and 10 of number 16, it says it is as is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to serve him and that has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren and the sons of Levi with you. Are you seeking the priesthood also? You see, what we see here is that Korah was dissatisfied with the menial tabernacle services that he was rendering. And this was actually an aspiration to be the high priest. And we all know that the, the, the office of the high priest was divinely instituted. And Korah was coveting something that could never be his. And it is this spirit of conspiracy that moves men to covet something that could never be theirs. It, because it claims co-equality with the leader, and that is one of the sins against the set man. We see that one of these features also is that it manifests itself in conspiracy against the Lord. If you look at verse 11 of number 16, it says, Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is an errand that you murmur against him? So one of the principles that we really, really need to understand is how serious this thing is. Because a conspiracy against your spiritual father or conspiracy against the set man is an in effect, the conspiracy against the Lord. You see, we must understand, if you reject your spiritual father, if you reject the set man, the saint one that God has sent you, you are actually rejecting the Lord himself. Why can I say this? Why can I make such a statement? The Bible makes it quite clear for us in John 13, verse 20, where it says, most assuredly, I say to you that he who receives, whomever I sent, receives me, and he who receives me, receives him who sent me. So you can see that if we conspire against the Satan, man, that is actually conspiracy against the Lord. Also, the Cora spirit or the Cora operating spirit will camouflage its intent against the set man. If you look at verse 11 of number 16, it says, Therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is an errand that you murmur against him? Now what we see here is that the set man's assistant is included in order to create the impression and the vibe that the conspiracy that's taking place is actually not just against the set man. And that, of course, is totally false. We see that the Kura system manifests absolute callous disobedience to the voice of the set man. In verse 12 of number 16, it says, As Moses said to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, but they said, We will not come up. So you can see that this Korah system, this Korah operating system that manifests itself is nothing but a system of rebellion. What it also does is it uses vision in order to discredit the set man. If you look at verse 13 and 14, and let me just read it to you, it says, 
is it a small thing that you've brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. So they will come, and this aura spirit, this operating system, will come against you, and especially if it takes time before God starts to manifest his promises, and the vision that is given to you, that they will tell you that um, and accuse you of all things. But we need to understand that whenever God speaks to us about vision, that the fulfillment of such vision takes time. And we see that what the Quora operating system does, it claims the unfulfilled vision as being a false vision in order to discredit the set man or the spiritual father. Another feature that we see of the Quora operating system is that it only has an outward form of worship. If you look at verse 17 and 18, it says, Each of you take his censer and put the incense in it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 censors, both you and Aaron, each with his censer. So every man took his censer, put fire on it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meet, meeting with Moses and Aaron. Now what we see here is that Korah and his associates had censers with incense. So, so they actually manifested the outward form of worship that would deceive any casual child of God that does not have the sin. And we see that this quarter system actually begins to create a church within a church. In Numbers 16, verse 24 to 27, now let me just read that to you. He says, speak to the congregation saying, get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation saying, depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of this, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and Nathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. So what do we see here? We see that the Lord admonished the congregation to separate themselves from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And we see that this conspiracy of the Korah system exposed two tabernacles. The tabernacle of the congregation and the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. The conspiracy against the set man is recognized by the building of a separate tabernacle. So we see it is a church within a local church. So what it actually boils down to, it is a split within the church. Another feature that we see of the Korah system is that we see it manifests a vision from one's own will. If you look at verse 28, still chapter 16, it says, Then Moses says, sorry, then Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. Moses here we see declared that his vision was not of his own will. Korah's vision, on the other hand, was a direct outflow from his own will. We see that the chorus system directly rejects God. If you look at verse 30, it says, But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. You see, again, as I've said earlier, conspiracy against the spiritual father, conspiracy against the set man is 
in effect the rejectors you know, of the Lord. And we know that the outcome of that, if you continue to read that chapter, is that the Korah followers were swallowed up by the earth. In verse 31, it says that the ground split apart under them. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them and they perished from among the congregation. Now, I know if we read these things, it sounds terrible, but it also at the same time tells us how serious God is in dealing with rebellion within the household of God. And if we look at this symbolically, we see that earth here represents, in effect, the world system. And we find that those that are involved in this conspiracy against the said man will slide back into the world. They will go right back into their own flesh and uh, become worldly and will follow worldly principles. Now, if you look at number 16, verse 38, it says, the senses of these men were sinned against their own souls. So the Quran system causes you to sin against your own will. The spirit of conspiracy causes men to sin against their own mind, their own emotions, and their own will. And when we allow mental invasion and thought insertion, it is a sin against your own soul. And we all know the scripture in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5, where it says that for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in the hand of God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we see that this system will cause you to sin against your own soul. What we also see, what the system does, it manifests the violation of your calling. If you look at verse 39, we see, it says, So Eleazar and the priest took the bronze censers, which those who were burned up had presented, and they were hammered out as a covering on the altar, to be a memorial to the children of Israel, that no outsider who is not a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he might not become like Korah and his companions, just as the Lord had said to him through Moses. Now we see these bronze censers of Korah were hammered out as a covering for the altar to be a memorial to the children of Israel of how dangerous it is to cross the boundaries of that which God has called you for. Korah also caused misunderstanding by the congregation in verse 41, it says, on the next day, all the congregation of the East, children of Israel murmured against Moses in the area, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. And because of the ignorance of the congregation, we see that they actually blamed Moses for God's judgment that came upon Korah and those who followed him. We see that this Korah system manifests ministry beyond the grave in verse 49. It says, now those who died in the plague were 14,700, besides those who died in the Korah incident. So what does it tell us? It tells us that 
This spirit of conspiracy destroys the ignorant, even after it has left. It has a profound ministry that comes from beyond the grave. The number it destroys when it is dead is even greater than the number it destroys during its life. In the Old Covenant, conspiracy was met with swift judgment. Now, what we see is that in the New Covenant, where sin abounds, we see that grace abounds even more. So we see that there are some churches that are the result of conspiracy. But the sad part of that all is that such churches we are seeing are being swallowed up by worldliness unless they come to a place of genuine repentance. So what does it teach us? I think one of the main things that we must really take to heart when we look at the Korah is that we need to deal ruthlessly with the spirit of rebellion. And also that when conspiracy is detected within the household, that it must be dealt with on a public platform, as we see that God has done in the case of, of Korah. It's not something that must be kept under the covers and uh, hidden. It must be dealt with publicly. Now, one of the other operating systems that I also want us to look at in this in this session is that of Cain. And uh, in Genesis 4, when we read about it in Genesis 4, verse 3 to 9, it says, And in the process of time it came to pass that Canaan, Cain sorry, brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the first kings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou dost well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the door, and after thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, this is a very, very interesting son, because Cain is the type of son in the house that you find that is filled with rage and envy when anybody else but himself is being favored by God. And we see that this offense in this person's heart will lead to murder. Now, today, in the times in which we live, uh, yes, most probably uh, we do see people getting murdered physically, but most of the time it will take place through bad-mouthing a person in the church by spreading stories, spreading lies, and all these things. So we must always watch out that when we start hearing these stories going around within the church, that we need to identify whether there is not this kind of operating spirit functioning in the house. Now, it's important that we look at Jesus' point of view when it comes to this, because if you look at uh, what Jesus said in Matthew 5, we see that Jesus called anger against the brother without a cause as being tantamount to murder. If you look at Matthew 5, verse 21 and 22, it says, You've heard that it was said by them of all time, You shall not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever say, shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, the fool shall be in danger of hell fire. You see, 
this game operating spirit feels no accountability for his brother and also has no respect for another brother in the in the house. I think it will be maybe a very good practical thing to say it's all about me, myself and I, what I want. And I walk around with a chip on my shoulder and I'm constantly breaking down others within the house. Then we have the picture of the oldest son. Ach, and we all know the story of the of the prodigal son that we read about in Luke 15. And I'm not going to read all the all the um, all these scriptures. And I want us to look at this portion of scripture. And as I said, I'm not going to read it again. But what you need to understand in using the scripture, I'm using the law of what we call double reference. The primary reference of the parable is the relationship to our Heavenly Father. The secondary rever reference is to the household of faith. And what we see the oldest son is the Pharisee in the house. He is the religious son in the house. He comes to the house of the father. While we see when the younger son comes back, he comes to the father of the house. Um, this son, we see, has some other additional characteristics. He gets his information from the servants in the house. He's got no burden for his brother, for he sees himself as not being his brother's keeper. He does not even call him my brother, but when he speaks to his dad, he says, but this thy son. So he doesn't even recognize him as a brother. He cannot even come to that place where he's able and willing to rejoice with the fact that his brother has repented. And when he sees how the father forgives him and the kindness and the benevolence that the father shows towards this, the younger brother, we see that he despises it. And uh, what we also see is that he hoarded his inheritance. And if you study the portion of scripture, and as I said, I don't have time to do all of that. Uh, we see that he didn't go to the father. It is the father that had to come to him uh, to speak to him. So this is a very sad manifestation of the oldest son, of the operating system of the oldest son within a household um, where it's just religion and someone that does not want to speak to the father. Ah, we see it often in the in the wineskin of fathers and sons where sons will speak to other sons, but they will not speak to the father of the house. Then, of course, there's Isa. And if you study that portion in Genesis 25, verse 29 to 34, it says, and Jacob saw pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with the same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this be? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore to him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. If we read on to the next chapter, in chapter 26, verse 34 to 35, we find that it says, And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife, Judith the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Bashimath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite which were in grief of mind unto Isaac, to Rebekah. And we see that Esau married the Canaanites. This is a picture of carnal wives. He dishonored his parents. If you look at the New Testament, in Hebrews 12 and 16, it says, lest there be any fornicator, 
or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Exodus 22, 29 says, Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits and of thy liquors, the firstborn of thy sons, shalt thou give unto me. You see, we must understand that birthright has special privileges, special responsibilities and advantages that belongs to the one that is first born. And what in effect happened is that he despised the right to priesthood. In Exodus 22, 29, he despised taking care of his brothers, which would become his responsibility after his dad passed away. He so, said, if we look at the picture of Esau, it prefigures a son who does not value his birthright. He values his own carnal appetites more than his spiritual responsibilities. And we find that his carnal appetites are his idol. He is licentious, he's promiscuous, and in effect, an ungodly son. Then uh, there's others, and I'm just going to mention them shortly. There's Demas, or Demos, that is mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, where Paul said that Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, and Titus for Dalmatia. And we see that this is a picture, Demas is a picture of a son that would abandon his ministry responsibility because of the love for the world. Then, of course, there's Jonathan, also well known. We know that Jonathan was Saul's son. He loved David, but he was loyal to Saul. We see that this is a picture of a son who fellowships. He loves the new move of God. He enjoys the new move of God but he remains loyal to the old order. And sadly, he also dies with the old order. Then there's Joab. We read about that in 2 Samuel 2, verse 18. And there were three sons of Zeruiah there, Joab and Abishai and Asahel. And Asahel was as light of food as a wild road. Joab was the son of Zeruiah. He knew David's secrets. He knew that David had orchestrated the murder of Uriah. And we all know the story. You can read about it in 2 Samuel 11 that David wrote a letter to Joab and uh, where he said he must put Uriah in front of the big battle so that he might be smitten and that he might die. And when you study the scriptures, you find that as his relationship with David grew older, we see that Joab became increasingly more disrespectful towards David. He even threatened to call a city that they conquered after his own name if David delayed in coming. And uh, we read about that in 2 Samuel 12, verse 26 to 28. It says, and Joab fought against Rabbah of the children of Ammon and took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah and have taken the city of waters. Now therefore gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it lest I take the city and it be called after my name. Job also killed everyone that David loved. Absalom, Amasai, Abner, and he even followed Adonijah in the rebellion. So if you study the life of Joab, you see that this is a pre configuration of a son whose proximity, whose closeness to the father leads to a place in a position of familiarity. See, this son then comes to a place where he makes decisions without consulting the father. He's guided by his own revenge and his own ambitions. He crosses floors by joining the son of the father. 
And we see that he's one that you cannot count on in your old age. That brings me then to one of the other examples that we see in scripture, which is Reuben. In Genesis 35, 22, it says, And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land, that Reuben went and lay with Bila, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. So Reuben slept with his father's concubine. And eventually when we see what takes place in Genesis 49, verse 3 and 4, let me just read that. It says, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. And then look what it says in verse 4. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou went up to thy father's bed, then the files down, and he went up to my couch. What does it tell us? It says to us that Reuben slept with his father's concubine. He represents a son that would split his father's household of faith by stealing his father's sons and starting his own church. He's cursed with instability. He might do this more subtly. When a father releases a son to start his own ministry, we see that this son would go and fish in his father's pond. He cleverly seduced the sons of his father to join his church. This is a gross violation of conduct for a son who has been planted out or went without being sent to allow sons of his father to become members of his church. These are issues that needs to be dealt with at city church presbytery gatherings where the ethics of accurate building are reiterated often, reiterated often by announcements and by teachings. We know that we've encountered these kind of followers in the ABC network, especially in some of the churches in Phoenix, South Africa. And we see that even Paul warned Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, verse 20 to 20, one says, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. You see, what it tells us is that the house must be purged from these vessels of dishonor. And in this case, Paul was referring to Hymenus and Philetus. Let me just read you the scripture. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 16 to 18, it says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a cancer, and of whom is Hymenus and Philetus concerning the truth have aired, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. You see, these are the kind of sons that must be dealt with on a city level, city church level, where many fathers of different households gather together on a regular basis. And we can find that some of these signs then can be redeemed through the process of repentance and restitution. But this is the work of apostolic city fathers. Let me conclude this session by reading to you 2 Timothy 2 verse 25 to 26. It says, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his, at his will. <clears throat> Well, guys, this concludes this topic on sons behaving badly, giving you several examples of such sons. And this is very high level. 
you will have to go back and go and meditate, re-listen to the message, these two messages, and also just allow the Spirit of the Lord to speak to your heart, search your own heart, make sure that you don't find yourself in the position where you actually manifest yourself as being one of these songs. Well, thank you so much for listening to me. God bless you. And uh, we'll speak again soon. God bless.